Hello out there, and thanks for joining me for this session. My name is Gabe Hollenby, and I am a developer advocate here at Amazon Web Services. And in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about how to get started using AWS Step Functions for service orchestration. And later on in this talk, I'll be joined by Craig McCarter from Liberty Mutual to tell you from a customer perspective how they're using Step Functions in the real world as well. Let's get going. First, I want to start with a quote, and I've intentionally blacked out some of the uh, parts of the quote because I want you to focus on some of the keywords here. Here's a quote about someone uh, talking about a reliable, automated way of demonstrating, uh, or orchestrating rather, very complex queries and processes between all of our distributed systems, saving time and money, uh, gaining agility, and discussing solutions with non-technical stakeholders with greater ease. Well, this is a quote from Paul Brown from The Guardian. And they're talking about their experience using step functions. So let me tell you about step functions, and I want to contextualize it uh, with a simple example. So let's talk about how we normally get things done in the systems that we build. We generally start out with monoliths, where all of our different components of our solution are deployed together. Uh, in this case, I've you know, picked some icons about an example banking application. And monoliths are a great way to start, and sometimes they're a great way to, to leave your system as a monolith. You don't need to break it apart. But what we often see is over time, uh, it makes sense to start breaking out some of the functionality from a monolith into more focused, smaller services. And when you do that, you generally end up with services that have uh, their own data stores. And this is great because suddenly we gain increased agility uh, and scalability. Uh, we have the ability to you know, work in different code bases on different services and also scale them uh, horizontally uh, or vertically, uh, both on the compute and the data layer, as our needs vary from service to service. Now this is great, but with more services comes the challenge of figuring out how to coordinate them together to get things done. What used to be really easy in a monolith can become more challenging in a distributed fashion because you have to figure out how am I going to make these services talk to each other in a reliable and understandable way. And that's where step functions can make things better. So let me show you this in a bit more detail uh, using an example service orchestration. Uh, and we're going to talk about processing bank account applications. So here's a very overly simplified uh, example of how we might process an application to open a new bank account if we were a bank. Uh, we'll have an account application service, and that's the service that's job is going to be taking something from the initial interest, hello, I would like to open a bank account, all the way through an approve or a reject decision. And that service is going to collaborate with a data checking service, uh, perhaps to do some automated checks on identity documents and addresses to make sure they look okay. And in cases where the, the automated checks don't turn out okay, then we might want to flag it for human review. And a human would get involved, look at it, make a decision, and then we'd end up with an approve or reject decision uh, back in the account application service at the end of the day. So this is the same uh, collaboration flow that you just saw, but organized a little bit differently where each of these circles represents a step in the workflow. Uh, and this makes it look a little bit more like an executable flowchart, if you were. Uh, you know, we're going to start out with checking in parallel for identity documents and addresses. Then we'll see if a review is required, if either of those flags turned up uh, true. If so, then we'll wait for a human review. If not, we can approve automatically. Uh, and then once we get the review, if it was rejected, we'll reject it. If it was approved, we'll approve it. So what you're looking at, whether you know it or not, is something called a state machine. Now, a state machine just describes a collection of steps that you're going to split into discrete states to get some work done. Every state machine has a starting state, and only one state is active at a given time. And what happens is that active state gets some input. It decides, is it going to do some work with that input? Uh, maybe it's going to take an action. Uh, it's definitely going to say what state to transition to next, and it may generate some output as well. And that's how you piece your workflows together in a state machine fashion. AWS Step Functions, you can think of as a service that lets you do fully managed state machines in the cloud on AWS. There's a lot of benefits to encoding your workflows into state machines running in Step Functions. And I'm going to show you quite a few of these values here in the rest of the presentation. Um, the neat thing to know is it's useful for orchestrating not just between AWS services uh, that Step Functions knows how to integrate with natively, but also any of your own services that you write, as long as they can communicate with the Step Functions API, 
then step functions can orchestrate work through those services as well. It's pretty neat. So let's dive in. And before I show you how step functions works, I want to show you what it's like, the experience of using step functions and seeing what these executions look like in the web console. So let's look at the first demo. In this first demo, we're going to look at what happens when we get a successful result uh, for a new bank account application. So here, what you can see is I've got an existing step function executing, and I can click into any of these steps and see what the input and the outputs are. So I can see for that initial state, what was my input? Here, a valid name and a valid address, or things that look valid anyway. And so I can also click into each of these different states and see what their inputs and outputs are. So I can see that both of these data checking steps for name and address uh, came back with a flagged value of false. Uh, and uh, I can then see the, the next step, uh, which is going to look at the, uh, the inputs for those flag values to decide, do I need to approve or reject this application? And in this case, because neither one of the data checks returned a true flag, we can uh, assume that there were no, nothing flagged, we don't need to get a human involved, we can approve this application automatically. And that's the flow that you're seeing here. So just to call out a few specifics, what, what we're seeing here is the ability to click into any state from our state machine as it executed, even after the fact, and see what its specific inputs and outputs were uh, and what states, uh, all, what were all the states that the execution transitioned through in order to get to a finished state. Really, really helpful here. It's kind of like you put debugging statements everywhere in your code and you instrumented everything, uh, but you didn't have to because it was already done for you. Uh, so you could inspect the states afterwards. Now let's look at a different case where we need to get a human involved. Uh, and so for this case, uh, imagine that you know, one of the, uh, the address happens to look funny, for example. And so here's another execution. It's actually still running. You can see that. And if we look at it, we can note that uh, the input here for this execution shows an address that doesn't match a valid pattern for what address it should look like. And so it got, it got flagged as needing review. And now we can simulate uh, uh, rejecting this application. So a human got involved. Uh, in some other system, they submitted the application ID uh, and said, I want to reject this one. And this Lambda function is just going to call out to the state machine, uh, so the step functions API, rather, and uh, pass in a unique task token that says uh, what task we were paused on, and now it's got that state uh, in order to continue executing. I'll explain this in more detail later when we look at how we define our state machines. But what you can see there is the state machine effectively was paused and waiting for our input. And that input happened asynchronously from another system that was able to call back to the step functions API and say, I'm passing in uh, some new state information. Uh, this, you know, this task uh, that I'm paused on got this result. Please continue your computation. And in this case, you know, it, we could see that step functions resumed its execution. It saw that we got a manual reject decision, and so we rejected the application. So that's what it kind of looks like to use step functions, but Let's look at it in more detail now from a code perspective. What are the moving parts? What are the concepts you need to understand? So you define your state machines in something called the Amazon States language, or ASL. And this is a JSON-based uh, language where you're basically passing all the different parameters that you need to define a state machine. Uh, you can see we have a uh, start at uh, name state, in this case, hello world. And then we have a states property that contains a set of all of the different states that we're going to define for our state machine. And then each, uh, each state has a type uh, and whatever appropriate uh, parameters that are, are there for that type in order to describe some kind of work for that type of state, whether it's a state that does work or whether a state that makes choices about the inputs and, and outputs, etc. So looking at our example workflow for opening a bank account, Let's see what types of steps we're using here in the, in the workflow I defined. The first thing you, you can do is all these steps here are doing, uh, performing a task. There's a task step. And that can be calling a Lambda function. That's a very common thing to do in a step function, but it doesn't need to be a Lambda function. As I said before, uh, if you have a worker process happening somewhere else, you can effectively pull step functions and say, are there any tasks that are waiting for activity type X to be performed? Because I know how to do those. So if you pass me that parked data, I'll do that com compute and pass you the result back. Uh, or you can integrate with many AWS services that Step Functions supports besides uh, AWS Lambda. So this is a specific example of one of these uh, task states that's calling a Lambda function. Uh, 
uh, for verifying identity documents. And you can see here that we're basically passing in information from our state in step functions to the invocation parameters for a lambda function uh, and identifying which lambda function we want to invoke. Uh, and this is happening in parallel, uh, where we're doing one for identity documents and one for check addresses. But I'll get to that in a minute. So as you can see, you have the ability to optimize and do work in parallel uh, when it makes sense. Because our identity check and our address check don't depend on the inputs or outputs from each other in order to do their work, we can do them in parallel. And so the way you do this in step functions is you pass an array of mini state machine definitions that are the branches uh, that you want to execute in parallel. And step functions will do all that work, and then once all the branches are done, it rolls all of their little results up into an array that you can inspect further on. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, here's an example of this parallel step, where you can see this type of state uh, is type parallel. And it has a branches property where we're going to pass in little state machine definitions that start at and give a state name, and then uh, a collection of all the state names that would implement that particular branch. We can also see that we're passing a variable here called result path, or a property in here called result path that says, I want to take all of this work and put it in a new variable in my state output called checks. And that's what the human review required uh, state, the next one, is going to look at in order to make a decision about what needs to happen next. So speaking of choice states, let's look at this now. So these are the two choice states in this flow. And a choice state is like a switch statement in programming. It's going to look at uh, an array of uh, expressions uh, and figure out which one matches. And the first matching one, if any match, uh, will tell it, OK, this is the state I want you to transition to. And you can specify a default value uh, if none of the, your conditions match. So here's how we implement that human review required check. To type choice, and then you can see we pass an array of choices. Uh, in this case, these are choice expressions that are comparing uh, values in our state to some variables. And then we have a default state to go to if neither one of our choice expressions works. So this basically says if, if either element from our parallel checks for ID and, and address checking returns flag true, then we'll go to wait for review. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and approve the application. Now finally, this is uh, another thing I just want to call specific attention to, is this ability to wait for a callback uh, from some other process that's happening. And one way you can do this, if you want to uh, call out to a Lambda function, for example, uh, with some state and then say, wait for some other process to call an API back, is uh, you can generate what's called a task token and pass it to one of the integrated services that uh, AWS knows how to, to integrate with. I'm sorry, that Step Functions knows how to integrate with. Uh, and then what needs to happen later is that some process needs to call the Step Functions API back with a ten send task success or send task failure API call saying, uh, here's the results of me trying to do that work for that task. And then the workflow will resume its execution uh, accordingly. So this is what it looks like in this particular example, where I'm going to say, I want to invoke a Lambda function called flag application for review, and I want step functions to generate a task token for me. So that's what that notation there looks like with task token with the dollar signs. And I'm going to pass in the current bank account application ID and that generated task token to that Lambda function to flag that application for review. And that might go ahead and uh, update a row in a database somewhere, and then uh, also store that task token alongside with my application. So then when the human review service uh, looks for what applications are flagged and someone sees this one and they make a decision, once that service gets the decision from that human, that service would be responsible in this case for using that task token and calling back with the send task success API call to step functions to do its work. Uh, and as you can see here, we'll store the result path uh, after we get that send task success uh, in a new variable called review decision. And then we'll transition to the uh, review approved check to see if we should review, I'm sorry, approve or reject the application. Now, errors can also happen uh, as you're orchestrating your services uh, for a number of reasons, right? Timeouts uh, or uh, failed tasks are, are not as uncommon as you would think, especially with distributed services. Some things will fail eventually. And so you really do want to have robust uh, retry capabilities and also the ability to uh, meaningfully branch out uh, for certain types of errors in your state machines and do different things in, in response. And Step Functions can handle that for you in a really nice fashion. So let's look at one last demo that shows how to handle errors. So for this case, uh, we're going to show an example of actually uh, simulating an error by saying if we get a name that has unprocessable data as the name, then our, uh, our ID check uh, 
uh, function would throw an error. And here's an invocation that passes in such an invalid name uh, and to the input. And as you can see, uh, with the name that, that we don't know how to process, uh, we've caught an error uh, because I updated this step function definition to look for this particular error type. And I can see here that what the error was, in this case my unprocessable data exception, plus also the stack trace, uh, which is really useful. And then because it doesn't make sense to process data either automated in an automated fashion or with manual review if there's nothing really useful to review, for this example it makes sense to maybe have a new state to transition to called flag application as unprocessable. So we'll do that in this case and that'll be the end of, of this particular workflow. So step functions uh, can integrate with a number of AWS services and the only thing I can tell you is uh, this list will continue to grow with time. Uh, in fact, there's one recent service integration that's not even on this slide because it happened very, very recently. So in addition to all the ones you're seeing up here, uh, at the time of recording, uh, we also now support integration with uh, Amazon Athena uh, from Step Functions. Now this list, again, it continues to expand over time. And I also want to remind you that you can, in addition to talking to these native AWS services, you can also talk to your own ones, which I haven't covered in the demos, but uh, the documentation will teach you how to do that. And so if you want to learn about how to integrate with the built-in uh, integrations that Step Functions can do for you, or with your own services, the documentation is really easy to understand and very thorough, so just take a look at it here uh, on our website in our developer guide. So lastly, I just want to quickly talk specifically about handling high volumes of events because it's a really useful, uh, it's a useful ability to have and Step Functions has some specific capabilities around that that I haven't shared yet. So in addition to the workflows that you saw me talk about before, which you can think of as standard workflows, we also have the ability with Step Functions to do uh, something we call express workflows. Now these are uh, a different, basically just a different type of uh, state machine that you, you can create uh, with a type called express uh, and they're made to handle you know, 100,000 events or higher per second. Really high volume event processing. They're also not made to run longer than five minutes. So before when we saw that we had a step function uh, pausing and waiting for that human review, uh, in standard workflows they can pause for up to a year. Uh, but these express workflows are meant to start and finish very quickly. So they're, they're not really a good use case for if you need to get a human involved, uh, but if it's just a bunch of computers processing things very quickly with different tasks, uh, and you know you can get it done in under five minutes, and you have a high volume of events, express workflows are what you want to look at, because they'll be much more cost effective at scale. So I'm not going to go through all the differences between standard and express workflows, but I want to call out just a few. I've already told you that the difference in duration uh, the maximum duration is 365 days for standard workflows and five minutes for express. Um, the other really interesting one on this slide that I want to call out is the execution semantics. So uh, standard delivery, uh, standard uh, workflows do uh, exactly once uh, execution, whereas express workflows provide at least once execution. Uh, and that's a really important distinction uh, to pay attention to. Uh, but I know that Craig is going to talk about that more in just a minute, so I'll let him share you the details there and his pro tips uh, from a customer side. Uh, also worth noting is that the uh, visual uh, monitoring and debugging that you saw me do in the console in those demos, that works for the standard workflows, uh, but Express workflows simply log to Amazon CloudWatch logs, uh, so you don't have the ability of uh, clicking through and, and seeing each state's input and output uh, in that visual fashion. And there's these other differences too, uh, but you can read uh, the full extent of the details also in our developer documentation if you're curious. And so with that, you know, you shouldn't just hear me talking about step functions and how cool they are. Uh, I want to give uh, one of our great customers a chance to share uh, his knowledge and experience about working with step functions as well. So now I will pass the virtual mic over to Craig and he'll tell you about Liberty Mutual's experience working with step functions. Craig, take it away. Hi, I'm Craig and Carter. I'm a technologist with Liberty Mutual. Liberty are a hundred year old global insurer. We've been on our cloud journey for the last 10 years. I lead a team of developers responsible for a data integration platform. That is, we're taking financial transactions from our operations around the world. We're performing calculations and transformations on those before feeding those to our internal reporting systems. I'm here today to share a little bit about how serverless and in particular step functions has enabled our product journey. We touched on a number of different challenges, not least one of scale. We process hundreds of millions of transactions per month, 
And these transactions arrive with us, uh, very unevenly distributed through that period, focused largely towards the book close, um, while the first at the end of the month, while the first few months are very, very quiet. These two factors combined give us some really interesting scaling challenges. On top of this, then, we also have a strong focus on the speed of onboarding, how fast we can add new data integrations to our platform to further increase the adoption over time. One of the first decisions we made was to leverage the serverless architecture. This made a lot of sense given our usage patterns. Taking advantage of that pay per compute model serverless brings means that during those first few months, weeks of the month, we're not paying an awful lot and we only pay when we're actually processing transactions. In addition to this, service gives us a great ability to scale to meet um, unexpected demand. We model all of our data transformations as distinct Lambda functions, allowing us to build, test, and deploy and manage each of those as individual components. Then this is where Step Functions plays its role. Step Functions allows us to orchestrate each of those um, Lambda functions in whatever order and whatever sequence we need to achieve our business goals. Let me give you a bit of a flavor. In production today, we run over 60 different workflows, each satisfying a different business use case, yet those draw on a small pool of only around 12 distinct Lambda functions. Some of those functions run in every workflow, while others run in only a few. Some of those functions run just once per workflow, while others can be run multiple times. What's important here is that Step Functions gives us the flexibility we need to, to orchestrate and to configure our Lambdas to satisfy our, our distinct business goals. The next thing we need to consider is that things fail all the time, and we need to be able to deal with that. Remember, we're not a system for counting clicks on a web page. We're a financially significant system, and every one of our transactions has a, has a financial bearing. Step functions give us really powerful capabilities to be able to define a retry um, behavior at a, at a function level in our workflows, as well as error handling. On top of this, it's got built-in monitoring and logging to allow us to monitor the performance of our um, workflows over time. Speaking about performance, back in 2018 when we first started development, Express workflows weren't uh, available. We were running a step function for every transaction we, we, we processed. This gave us this pattern of having a massively concurrent workflow execution with very short um, run times. And you see um, a graph here showing our, our start ex execution patterns. We go from doing nothing to doing an awful lot very, very fast. What we found was with traditional step functions, we were very quickly hitting the limit of what we could achieve, particularly in terms of state transitions. That is that step from task to task within the workflow. The API limits weren't giving us enough to scale the way we, we really needed to. We talked to the um, step function service team and they were able to give us an early preview of Express Workflows. Express Workflows were announced at reInvent 2019, and it totally changed the model for how we can scale using Step Functions. First, the word about migrating from Step Function to Express Workflow, it was really very simple. At Liberty, we manage all our infrastructure as code. So all we had to do was add that state machine type Express into each of our cloud vision templates. And we went from having a fleet of Step Functions to having a fleet of Express Workflows. We also opted to add that logging configuration so that we could continue to monitor our, our workflows. The benefits have been staggering. We've gone from paying roughly $30 per million transactions we process in step functions to paying $1.1 per million transactions we process using Express Workflow. That's a 96% reduction. And that's largely due to the fact that our use case aligned perfectly with the um, Express Workflow use case, those short snappy invocations running massively concurrent um, workflows. On top of this, we also have that fantastic ability to scale far beyond what we do today, that as we look to the future, we can continue to grow this platform. When it comes to Express Workflows, I can't emphasize enough, you gotta pay attention to that line in the docs where it says at least once workflow execution. Gabe's already mentioned it and I'm gonna mention it again. During development, you probably won't see this, your volumes won't be high enough. But as you push into test and then production, sooner or later, you're going to kick off a workflow and it's going to run more than one time. My team see this at, at our scale every day. We've been able to um, design and work our system to, to cope with it. You've got to look at every time you're writing the data stores, when you're triggering SNS topics, when you're executing external events. These things need to be able to happen more than once without any negative side effect. 
it can be a challenge, but the trick is to consider it as early on in your design as possible. So what does my system look like? We receive data on an S3 bucket, and we have a data preparation process that puts our financial transactions into S3, and puts the keys to those onto a DynamoDB table. From there, we stream those records, those keys, into Lambda that kicks off our Express workflows. The reason for this separation is for security. We encrypt all of our financial data at rest in S3, and we want to mitigate the chance that any of our financial records will show up in plain text in the Step Function Console or in the CloudWatch logs. From our workflows then, each of our transformation lambdas reads and writes the S3 bucket, and we track um, progress of all our workflows, workflows using DynoDB. Once they're all complete, we've got an extract process that gathers all the data and formats it before we send it to the destination systems. We also have a reporting workflow that leverages the glue and analytics capabilities within AWS. So what have my team learned? Serverless has been really powerful for us to deal with unpredictable usage patterns, bursting from doing nothing to doing an awful lot of work very fast, and taking advantage of that billing model too. Step Functions has really enabled us to capture the reuse of our, of our um, business logic, not having to reinvent the wheel every time we have a new data in, in, in integration. And then making that migration from Step Function to Express Workflow was a final piece in the puzzle for us to, to be able to scale the running hundreds of millions of transactions while keeping a firm control on the cost of our, of our runtime. Well, thank you for listening to me today. I hope you've got something out of this. I'm going to pass you back to Gabe now. Cheers. Thanks, Craig. I really appreciate you taking the time to share what Liberty Mutual has been doing with Step Functions and all the learnings you've had along the way. Finally, before we wrap up, I just want to give all of you out there one of my pro tips for how to work more effectively with Step Functions if you're excited and, and you want to get really hands on. And that's, I want to draw your attention to the AWS Toolkit uh, for Visual Studio Code. Now, if you're not aware, we have something called uh, the AWS Toolkit, which is uh, extensions for a lot of common uh, IDEs that you might use, uh, like Eclipse and IntelliJ and Visual Studio and VS Code. Now, I like Visual Studio Code. And so I'm just going to show you some screenshots on how the AWS Toolkit for VS Code extension works uh, with Step Functions, because it's a pretty popular choice, and there's some really nice quality of life improvements here. So as you can see, as you author your Step Functions, uh, you can see them visualized right there in your editor, which is immensely helpful. You also have the ability to have code snippets, so it reminds you what you need to type for these different types of uh, task states, for example, or different states. There's also intelligent auto-completion as you're typing to make sure that you're you know, passing values that match what you've got elsewhere to find in your uh, ASL. And there's validation and, and linting, so we can make sure that uh, you, know, you don't have any syntax errors or anything like that in the, uh, the documents you're writing. Really, really useful, and I encourage you to give it a shot. So I've hopefully inspired you to learn more about working with Step Functions today. Uh, if you want to learn more, these are the three places you should go. Uh, there's a, a workshop that takes about two hours to complete. Also check out the developer guide and our reference architectures. And so I really uh, hope that I've inspired you today. Again, Step Functions, think of it as state machines running in the cloud on AWS, fully managed, it's serverless. Uh, that means we'll handle the high availability and the automatic scaling for you. It also means that it's pay per use. You're not provisioning any server resources that are gonna sit there idle. Uh, and you can learn more about the different uh, billing models for standard and express workflows on the website. So step up and go build. Thank you.